Welcome in. Lake Kick is live. It is the year of our Lord, 2021. The date is Thursday night. It is May 20th. Jam-packed show. You won't see that again unless you watch the live version. I'm Josh Pate. Happy to have you with us. You'll see that pretty much as long as you watch the show. We got a jam-packed show tonight. Why would we have anything else? We're going to do something that we normally have to wait a little bit later into the summer to do, but with the way that the sports betting world is changing, you get some lines out a little bit earlier than you normally do. So those of you who watched the Sunday night show, you saw that we gave you the old-fashioned Pate State line projections on games. Now, I thought, even though it looked like we designed it otherwise, I thought we were going to have to wait a couple of weeks, Colin, maybe a month, before we got to compare us versus hashtag the man out in hashtag the desert. We didn't. They did it like 72 hours later, which begs the question, did we adjust the market? Ellipses. To be determined there. We get to compare our numbers to Vegas tonight, and I'm going to show you some thus far not seen projections that we have And these aren't just going to be projections. I'm going to give you our actual in-house model number versus the odds makers numbers that have been released on some big games. What do we got? A&M versus Bama. Um, I'm going to give you something off the radar, maybe like Oklahoma State, Boise State. There's some value out there, so I'm going to show you what we think in a second. Transfer portal, there were updates today. There were previously 50 kids that we had ranked. Well, a full top 100 got released today. I got to be honest with you, back about three or four months ago when we were having internal meetings about this, we didn't know how many kids we were going to be able to rank. Turns out you can rank them to infinity and beyond because we got that many in the portal. I think over 2,000 at last check. So I'm going to give you a number of takeaways from that. Normally, I would not go down the route with Kirby and Dan Mullen that we're going to go down tonight. But Bud Elliott, All kind of misbehavior on the Cover 3 podcast has really necessitated that I take the ball and run with it, or the low-hanging fruit, if you will, and run with it. So we got to go down the road of Kirby and Dan Mullen tonight. I put out a Twitter poll about an hour, hour and a half ago. Just pretend you have a university. you got a program. It's Pate State for me. Could be fill in the blank for you. You can hire one of them. Who whomst, whomst would you hire? Dan Mullen, Kirby Smart. More on that in a second. And some head coaches with the most to prove. Neither of those guys are going to be on the list, for me at least, but we got some head coaches with a lot to prove. Hey, man, we're doing really good numbers right now. The YouTube show, Lake Kick Live, which you're watching right now, is doing really good, but man, our podcast numbers are doing really well, um, and you're, you're marketing for us. And that's the only thing that I really ask, as you know. We have not asked you to contribute a dime to the cause here. All we ask you to do is like the videos, subscribe, leave the five-star reviews. But I'll tell you what, I've really seen get us a lot of traction lately. And you know that we don't do off-seasons around here. You've bought into that. And you've also taken it upon yourself to market for us. And before I dive into the show, I just got to thank you because here's what helps. Anytime you are tweeting out evidence that you are watching or listening to the show, tag us in there, tag me in there, at Late Kick Josh. Anytime you put in your Instagram story photographic evidence that you're watching or listening to the show, at Late Kick Josh, tag me in it. I'm sharing that stuff. Ten days out of the week, I'm sharing that stuff. So thank you so much for that. A lot of you love that we did an hour-long show the other night. I can assure you that was by accident. And uh, there were a lot of people around here that were yawning by the time that thing was over. But if you liked the hour-long show, and a lot of you did, you will love it around here this fall. So let's dive in tonight because we have got uh, not quite an hour-long show, but we have a lot to get to. On Sunday night, I showed you a lot of our projections for point spreads. And of course, a lot of people wildly misinterpreted what we were talking about around here. What we did not do Sunday night was predict games. What we did not do was give you our opinion on what the numbers should be. What we did simply was tell you with about five or six games of the year, I think we just did week one actually, we told you what we thought the Vegas number was going to be. Now, I got ripped to pieces up and down the wall and sideways twice on Sunday about the LSU at UCLA line. A lot of you just got all bent out of shape about the Georgia and Clemson line. Well, Jesse, as you know, because you have the graphic right there in your holster ready to fire at any second, what was eventually going to happen and why I kept my mouth shut is someone was going to be proven right and then you were going to be proven wrong. You're looking at the someone here. Do I sound cocky? Yes, I do, because this is no longer theoretical. Let's take a look at how we fared, shall we? Keep in mind, all we had to go on was our unique intuition around here. We said North Carolina would open as a six-point favorite. They opened as a a six-and-a-half-point favorite. We liked Bama minus 18 against Miami. Bama opened minus 17-and-a-half. We liked Clemson minus four against Georgia. Clemson minus four it was against Georgia. Here's the one that I told you was going to get a lot of traction. We told you LSU was going to be under a field goal favorite at UCLA. Not only were they, the odds makers went even closer to zero than we did. I went LSU minus two and a half. 
They opened at LSU minus one and a half. And then what was part B of that? If you'll re recall, I told you that was going to be the heaviest bet side immediately. And lo and behold, LSU all the way up to three already. We liked Notre Dame minus 10. They gave us Notre Dame minus nine and a half. And I thought the easiest one on the board was Louisville versus Ole Miss. We had Ole Miss minus seven and they had Ole Miss minus seven. And so it was that we were really validated by the odds makers. Now we'll actually down the road a little ways get to pick which side we like in those games. And I want to stress the picking is what we haven't done yet. A projection is just that, a projection. The one that caught me by surprise, conveniently the one I didn't send Jesse to put in the graphic, was Wisconsin. They host Penn State to start the year. Wisconsin, I thought they were going to be up north of six, maybe six and a half, and they're favored by four and a half. Now, you may think two points, what's the difference? To me, it's a huge difference. I don't like being more than a half point, maybe at the max a point off on these. And you may also ask, how in the world did you guess right that often? Because we got good numbers. That's how. So stay tuned because you'll see a lot more of us weaponizing those numbers as it gets closer to the season. Ramen Noodle Express, toot toot. Here's what I wanted to do, though. Because it's, it's pointless, well, it serves a little bit of a self-esteem purpose, but otherwise, it's pointless to just sit here and talk about how right we were. Here's what I want to do now. There are several games that were released, not just week one. There were several other games that have been released. I think we'll have more coming by the end of next week. Just a little birdie in my ear. But we've got some week two games, some week three. I'm going to show you three games from week six here, and I want to roll down these, and I want to show you what the Vegas number is, and then I want to show you what we at the Pate State Sportsbook actually have. Not as a projection, but what our line would be on the game today. But keep in mind, our advantage is we don't have to have you bet on this. So this is just our true feel on the game. The first one is Texas at Arkansas in week two. Big opener for Texas in week one against Louisiana. But then they go to Arkansas in week two. And there's a lot of push back and forth when we did our schedule draft of whether this should be the game that we're at in week two. We don't have to make that decision yet, but we differ here. We differ from the odds makers. Odds makers have opened this up, and if you haven't already seen the numbers, you can play along with me right now. Texas at Arkansas, what would you put out there? Well, they put out Texas minus four. We think it's too fat. In fact, we cross a very key number here. We cross field goal. We've got Texas minus two and a half. Full disclosure, I have moved personal finances on this game already. So I like Arkansas there. Again, it is May, and I want to stress it is May, so there are very small limits on these games. Not that yours truly is in a position to push the limits of any sports book out there, but I did take a shekel or two and toss it over there on the hogs because I think that that will come down to the number three at the very least before kickoff. How about week two? Same week, the biggest game, the game on the marquee, the one that we have picked tentatively to attend, is Oregon at Ohio State. Before Jesse even shows you that slider there, what do you think? Because a lot of you have told me you liked Ohio State minus as much as 14, or as many as 14. Someone can correct me on that. And it wasn't there, and we told you it wasn't going to be there. I didn't give you a number the other night, but I told you it's not going to be up near two touchdowns. You have the power to bet it up there, but it wasn't going to open there. So here we go. The line that actually got put out on this thing, Oregon at Ohio State in week two, is Oregon as a nine-point dog, not a two-touchdown dog. So Ohio State minus nine is the open there. I go to our trusty odds that I'm looking at right here, and I look at our power ratings, and we agree. We got them minus nine and a half, so we virtually agree dead on the money with the number that Vegas initially put out on this. I didn't see a ton of movement. Um, so any of you who were of the opinion and wanted to back it up with your own money that Ohio State should be a double-digit or bigger favorite. It wasn't backed up by the professionals. This number did not get assaulted nearly as much as some of these others did. There's one that's a little bit off the radar that I want to go to in week three because we took some action on this one. Oklahoma State is at Boise State in week three. Current line is Oklahoma State minus four. So what do you think about this? What do you think about Boise? For that matter, what do you think about Oklahoma State? Because perception is going to go a long way in deciding where this one's going to go. Let me tell you, I, I hesitate. I'm, I know what we have Boise rated at in our own power ratings, but I hesitate in the perception versus reality game with the Broncos. Because you still in the back, back, back of your mind, when you think of Boise, the first thing most of you think of is a blue football field, uh, which does matter when they... Uh, egregiously let them wear matching all blue uniforms on that blue field. But I've said, spoken my piece on that. But what you think is 
Chris Peterson, heyday. That's what you think. Well, there are two coaches removed from that now. Boise's got a very solid program. But I think that some of the residue of how tough it has been for so long to go up there, you had Brian Harson come in there after that. He's at Auburn now. I think that still is apparent on some of these numbers. Also a little inside baseball here that you may not realize, Boise for quite a while, numerically, has been given some of the biggest home field advantage baked into point spreads as any team in America. You can justify that however you want to, or you can poo-poo that however you want to. The fact of the matter is, it's been really hard for teams to go in there and perform at a comparable level to the way they would elsewhere. So Vegas opens this thing, Oklahoma State minus four. I took some action on Oklahoma State because we've got it at Pate State Sportsbook all the way power rated at Oklahoma State minus six and a half. I am a big believer in the perception versus reality game here. And I think what our numbers and our model is picking up on is our opinion of Boise. It is not flatlined, but it's probably a little softer than a typical odds maker's opinion out there. I also think that the home field that you would bake in for Boise State in a normal scenario does not apply as much when a Power 5 team goes in there. Because the impact, normally, that playing at Boise has on teams is the impact that it's having on a non-Power 5 team. Now, you're going to be jacked to have a Power 5 team come in. That's not what I mean. But Oklahoma State's got a locker room full of kids that have played in Norman. I mean, they've gone to Iowa State. They've gone to Texas. The environment's not what's going to shake them. If you've got a better football team, then you can beat them. But that's not what's going to shake them. So because of those two factors, I got Oklahoma State up close to a touchdown. I think we had them... Uh, Oklahoma State minus 6.7, and I rounded it down to 6.5. Week six is going to be the biggest week of college football this year, in my not-so-humble opinion. And I got three of them right here. Red River Shootout, hopefully a noon game so that we can pull, well, the plan that we told you about Sunday night. Oklahoma versus Texas, what you think? What do you have? You run your own sports book out there. But keep in mind, the public's going to be able to bet this when you put it out. What line would you put out? Well, the uh, professionals that have to take action on these games put out Sooners minus 11 and a half. And so I looked at it, and I'll tell you, initially, I thought that we may lean Texas on this. But then I dove into our Pate State power ratings, and no. We actually agree. Jesse, I think we agreed right on the number. I had Oklahoma minus 11 and a half, which is the exact same number that Vegas put out there. It's a monster week, though. There you see Jesse showing it to you. It's a monster week because not only do you have Oklahoma-Texas going on, but you also have a couple of other big games. I can't get to all of them. I got a couple of them to get to right now. But there are monster games like Penn State, Iowa. I don't even have time to talk about it tonight. That could be a huge game. Imagine Penn State beating Wisconsin in week one. Imagine Iowa beating Indiana and Iowa State weeks one and two. You get down the road a little ways, you're not talking about fringe top 25 teams. You could be talking about a top 10 matchup there that we don't even have time for. That's how loaded this week is. Here's a game we do have time to talk about. The game we'll probably be at one of at least one that day, maybe more, Alabama at Texas A&M. This one's fun because I noticed a trend with our internal power numbers versus the odds makers' power ratings and, therefore, the lines they put on these games. Alabama seems to be about one to one and a half points inflated in the actual lines that have been put out versus what we have internally. So you're going to notice a trend. I'm only going to show you one Alabama game tonight. But as we start to show you our opinion on Alabama games versus the actual Vegas number, you'll notice we're just a little bit smaller on Bama. So what do you think here? Alabama at Texas A&M, probably a night game. We'll see. Texas A&M opens as a 13-point dog. This figures to be Alabama's stiffest competition in the regular season. Uh, Bama goes to Florida, by the way. They opened as a 15-point favorite at the Swamp. That's a week three game. Bama minus 13. Pate State Sportsbook, you'll notice a trend here, has Alabama minus 12. So we think there is about a point to a point and a half's worth of inflation, which is just a natural, you can look at it as a tax at this point that you're having to pay if you want to keep betting that team that's been the best in America at any given point over several years now. There's another big game all the way out on the West Coast that we're going to have a chance to talk about down the road. This was the biggest discrepancy. I saved it for the end. The biggest discrepancy between the Vegas numbers on these big games, at least, that got put out and the Pate State Sportsbook model was Utah traveling to USC. Could very well be that the Pac-12 South is on the line here. Herm Edwards is calling me right now, and I guarantee if I answer the phone, he says we got something to say about that. But at the very least, we have Pac-12 championship ramifications here. USC got put out as a four-and-a-half-point favorite in this game, 
We weren't even close to that. This is, again, a game that I've taken some personal action on already. USC minus four and a half in the desert. We got USC minus one and a half. And I looked into it a little bit further because that's a three-point discrepancy from a number that professionals put out, which really raises my eyebrow. If anything, it scares me that we may be wrong. Uh, we may be wrong, but it's validated. When I dive into the numbers, it's a combination of us being about a point higher on Utah than they are and about a point, point and a half, eh, about point and three quarters lower on USC than they are. So we like really already Arkansas plus the points against Texas. I really like U Utah plus the points against USC. And, hey, I could uh, easily lean Oklahoma State minus four right now at Boise. This is the tip of the tip of the iceberg relative to what we will be getting into from a betting standpoint as the season gets closer. We will not have time during the week for all the betting talk that we want to get in, which is why at Late Kick Josh on Instagram and Twitter is something you're really going to want to be following. Let's move on. That's what we're going to do. We're going to clap now when we, when we trans, uh, transfer to new points here. The transfer portal got updated today in a very big way. We have now got a top 100. You go to 247sports.com, you look in football recruiting, and you click on that transfer portal. Whew, we got a lot of kids rated right now. I've got a piece of paper over here. It's a spreadsheet, and I could, in a very, very boring manner, just sit here and read off 1 through 100. There's not a lot of juice in that. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell you where it is if you want to go look at it shot for shot. But also, this is extremely valuable. It's valuable for you to have as a resource but we got a lot of coaches in the industry that are leaning on that thing, too. We got a lot of people who work inside complexes looking at that, too, because everyone is wondering the same thing. What's our evaluation process? Now, if you're obviously the defensive backs coach at Tennessee, it's a little bit different than being Steve Wolfong or someone who works at 24-7, but it's the same ball game. We're all trying to evaluate guys and put a proper rating on them. The difference is these kids aren't sophomores or juniors in high school. They are leaving a college program looking for another college program. Sometimes there's nothing wrong at all. Sometimes there's a red flag. Sometimes it could be physical, injury history, character related, could be a model citizen. And so it's very much a case by case basis. And the reason I'm pointing this out in advance of us talking about it is we have really stressed transparency about this. I've been listening to a lot of the conversations internally here. I read a lot of our guidance ahead of this. In fact, there's a long form article on the front page of 247sports.com right now where I think the guys that are on this panel, they kind of spelled out what the process is and how they're looking at things, how they're rating things. But it's very fluid. I mean, in a lot of cases, we're learning along with everyone else, but we do have a really good product out there uh, that I've spoken a lot about already today. But let's dive into this a little bit. Henry Toa Toa is now the number one rated kid in the transfer portal for this cycle. And his rating didn't really change. This is going to be something you really have to put a magnifying glass on. So Henry T is number one right now, and you may refer to that as him getting bumped up to number one. He didn't. What happened there is you had guys like Eric Gilbert, previously ranked number one. You had guys like Demarcus Bowman, who I think, yeah, we have listed fourth now. They fell. We don't even know if Gilbert's going to play college football this fall. Bowman, you could argue, is running second or third on the running back depth chart at Florida. And so you just... You find the best way you can rank those kids when they go in the portal, and really what you have to work off of is your previous recruiting ranking. But then when you get intel, which is how it becomes so valuable to have this network of contacts that we do at 24-7, once your ear is on the ground and you keep hearing a different hoof beat than the one you've already put in these rankings, you adjust them. That's what you do with high school kids. This is how you do it with college kids. You just do it a different way with college kids. So Henry T is number one. Those two fell, and you see Eric Gray right behind Henry Toa Toa at number two. I'm not on the panel. If I were, I wouldn't argue against Henry Toa Toa. I would simply argue for Eric Gray. I don't think anybody has benefited more from a transfer portal move this offseason than Eric Gray going from Tennessee to Oklahoma. But I don't know, to be honest with you, I know we dropped Eric Gilbert to number three but the question about Gilbert's not football right now. I mean, the question is, well, it is football. It's will he play football this fall? So I don't envy the position that the council that ranks these kids was in right now and is in because I don't know how you rank a guy when the questions are not, you know, what kind of, what kind of longevity does he have physically? What kind of hands does he have? Can he run? No, it's will he play? Is his, is his off field going to be in order to the degree that needs to be to play? And then you got to figure out where he's going to be because he is the only one 
Other than uh, the number 10 player there, I can see it's very small. That's why I'm squinting so much. With a 24-7 logo next to the name, which means they haven't committed anywhere. Or in Eric Gilbert's case, he did, and then he backed out of that. So I wanted to move past that, though, because I wanted to go to Florida State for a second. Florida State is just killing it right now. I told you we have 100 kids ranked. Florida State's got six of them. And what Mike Norvell is doing at Florida State is something that a lot of coaches are going to try and perfect the art of. When you come in the door, it used to be in the old school, you had to say, give me three years so I can overturn the roster. Well, Mark, Mike Norvell is showing you, you can probably say, give me 12 to 18 months. I'm going to recruit kids, but then we're also going to really leverage the portal hard. Got to do what we got to do. It's not going to be our plan five years from now, but right now it's got to be the way we do it. Florida State has gotten several impact guys now. They didn't just go stock up on a bunch of slot corners just for the heck of it. Like, they went and got guys like, obviously, Mackenzie Milton, who could very well end up being their starting quarterback. But Jermaine Johnson from Georgia is now on this roster. They obviously hope he does for them what, let's say, Brenton Cox has done for Florida. Uh, they got Andrew Parchman at wide receiver. DJ Williams at running back is a kid that a couple of years ago, people around his old program would get in your ear and whisper, Hey, DJ Williams, like, I know we got these other guys, but we like him as much as anyone. Well, he didn't lose his talent. He didn't lose his ability. He just changed scenery. And now if you're in the right situation, you finally get featured the right way, all of that still could validate itself on the football field. They have done a wonderful job here. Now you got to see it pay off. I have told you once, I've told you a thousand times, these Florida schools, Miami, Florida, Florida State, they're in some of the most prime positions in the transfer portal era and the name, image, and likeness era if they handle themselves the right way, as any programs will be in America. I want to also, and I could go USC here, but I think I've talked about USC already with this. UCLA is another program I just want you to keep an eye on. So I know right now, if you hear anyone talking about UCLA, it's probably within the context of, hey, did you see UCLA is less than a field goal underdog against LSU in week one? Okay. That's valid. That's accurate. Pay attention to what Chip Kelly's doing in the transfer portal, too. Because Kelly on a West Coast is kind of similar to what those Florida schools are on an East Coast, Gulf Coast sort of deal of being in a talent-rich area, Southern California, USC. Same thing applies here. I could just as easily be talking about USC. A lot of kids leaving the area. Inevitably, any given cycle, a certain amount of kids are going to want to come home. You could be the landing spot. If you didn't land them the first try, land them the second try. They got a quarterback right now in Ethan Garbers that came home. Zach Charbonnet has come home at the running back position. I think those guys both are immediately eligible this year. I know Garbers, they were kind of surprised that the Pac-12 passed the ruling. I don't know why they were surprised, but they were. So he's going to be immediately eligible. Just watch this year, because last year wrecked a lot of things for a lot of teams. I mean, UCLA, for example, couldn't even get in their facility until it was time to play games, essentially. I don't know that Chip Kelly and his team would have done anything of note last year. I know they didn't have a shot to, kind of like James Franklin at Penn State. I can't tell you what they would have done in a normal year. I'm telling you anything they would have been capable of because of the way COVID disproportionately impacted them, it got wadded up and thrown out the window. So this is an evolving process. But I want to also caution you. We got 100 kids rated, and you may think to yourself, well, certainly, if they rated 100 kids in the transfer portal, I mean, good grief, every one of them that's ever going to have an impact, and then some's going to be rated. And the vast majority of the guys probably won't have an impact. Well, they're going to be certainly guys that have disproportionate impact. But I also would just caution you, don't think just because a kid's not rated in the top 100 that he couldn't be an impact player this fall. I thought Thomas Goldcamp, uh, a writer for our Florida site made a very good point today. He said, Daquan Newkirk, it's a transfer from Auburn, not rated right now. I don't believe in the top 100. Don't quote me on that. I could get in trouble. I don't think he's in the top 100. And Thomas said, you know, I'm covering this program every day, and I got my ear to the ground down here in Gainesville. Florida staff loves Newkirk. They think he's a very good fit. That's the word. That's the F word, and it's totally okay to say around here. Fit. It's going to be all about fit. You're going to have a guy maybe you don't view as a top 100 player. It doesn't really matter, all due respect. If that staff finds him, they find the puzzle piece that was like under the couch somewhere, and they put it in, and oh, it fits. If it fits, it fits. And if a guy like Daquan Newkirk fits at Florida for Todd Grantham and his defense, it doesn't matter if he was rated 13 or 113. I mean, the fact of the matter is you can find a lot of hidden gems 
in that transfer portal every year. This is just kind of the beginning. All righty. Let me compose myself, and let's roll on here. Kirby Smart and Dan Mullen, what do you think? All-encompassing. Not even going to really give context yet. I just want to float that out there, let it simmer for a second. Now I want to ask you an even more specific question. Would Florida fans trade Dan Mullen for Kirby Smart? You may think to yourself, this doesn't seem like a late kick segment. And it's really not a usual late kick segment. But Bud Elliott has caused a lot of trouble in the college football sphere this week. He's over on the Cover 3 podcast the other day. And I, I just think that he had gotten some sun down there in Florida and he was feeling a little good about himself, probably a little too good. And he walked in and he just, he chose violence is what he did, verbal violence. And he goes on that podcast and he says, almost matter of factly, uh, yeah, uh, you guys know sky is blue, water is wet, it's hot in July and Florida fans would absolutely trade Dan Mullen for Kirby Smart. Like everyone, everyone knows this, right? Can we just move on? Well, Swamp 24-7, the board there had about a seven or eight page deep thread of some disagreement. Twitter blew up about it. Now, some of them, you just may have an ax to grind with old Butterick himself. I can never imagine living that life. But some other people had valid pushback on this. So it turns out this was not a consensus amongst Florida fans. There were some who felt that way. But I want to ask everyone, because I want to expand it and zoom it out a little bit. I want to know. If you're not associated with either program, how would you feel about this? I put it out actually on Twitter about an hour ago. Now, this is not scientific, and I'm not suggesting it is. It's the closest I can come to it. So I said, hire one of these guys to run your program today. Kirby, Dan Mullen. We are about 2,500 votes deep in this right now. Kirby Smart ahead about 60% to 40%. I have no clue who's voting on this. I just know my followers are voting on it. I don't know who's awake in Gainesville versus Athens right now. But I think the best way to gauge this is not so much to ask Florida fan or Georgia fan, hey, would you trade or would you not trade? The best way to really do it, which is impossible, is to make sure that you exclude both Georgia and Florida fans. And let's find what the national perception on those guys is. Because nationally, I think it would become pretty obvious pretty quick there is a more universally desirable candidate amongst these two. And I think it would be Kirby Smart. I would fall on the Kirby Smart side here, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. I got about two or three truths that I could come up with off the top of my head. Truth number one, if we tie all the fan bases back in, is there are some Florida fans, I don't know what the percentage is, but there are some Florida fans who would trade Dan Mullen for Kirby Smart. There ain't a Georgia fan walking the planet who would trade Smart for Mullen. Those two truths I'm pretty sure about. Truth number three is I think if we took a purely national, what we would call an agnostic poll, which means we don't have believers of either program in here, and we just take it of Wisconsin fan or Oklahoma fan, I tell you, Paul Christ is gone today. Lincoln Riley's gone today. You can have one of them to lead the Badgers or the Sooners. Who you taking? I think we'd probably have about a 75-25 Kirby Smart Dan Mullen clip. And it's very simple. The philosophy there would be recruiting is the name of the game. The biggest knock against Dan Mullen in the South has been and continues to be guy doesn't take recruiting seriously enough. That's the knock. I, and you can disagree with it and say, what are you talking about? He's finishing fill in the blank any given year. That's true. I'm not telling you he's a bad recruiter. I'm not telling you Florida's a bad recruiting program. It's all contextualized into who's he trying to beat? They got Bama on the schedule this year. They got LSU every year. They got Georgia every year. They are not going to have a better roster than these kinds of programs ever, just fill in the blank year, ever at the current level they recruit at. You just got to do it at a higher level. They're very good, but they're very good in a category where the fan base is going to want you to be elite in. And the fan base has every right to because they walk outside every morning in December and it's 72 degrees and they stare at palm trees and they say, wait a second. Shouldn't anybody be able to recruit down here? Oh, look, look, a four-star wide receiver just rode by on a bicycle. I didn't even plan that. That's what it's like living in Florida. And if you can't land top three classes, they're looking around and saying, what's stopping us? And so if you asked any generic fan, they'd say, give me the recruiter. You can question his game day acumen, his X's and O's. Give me the recruiter. Because if I get the recruiter in there, eventually we're going to have the talent and we're going to have the, the massive facilities and the budget and we're going to be able to hire a monster staff and he's eventually going to get coordinator right and he's going to step out of the way. You know, when it's time to game plan, he's going to go down to the snack machine because he's gotten the talent or 
to a, put a finer point on it, since we're talking food metaphors, he put the ingredients in the kitchen, hire the right chefs, let him go to work, let him go work the speaking circuit during the week. Fan bases want the horses in the stable. If you got the coach that can get the horses, then you go get the coordinators who know how to saddle them up and know how to let them run the right way. If you can't do that, then by the very default of even having your best team, which Dan Mullen had last year, you still run the risk of losing three or four games in a shortened season because you just don't have good enough players across the board. That was what the fear would always be. But I do want to go back to this thing, this, this disagreement that happens a lot of times. You know I'm serious because I put the pen down. Some people out there would lead you to believe Kirby Smart's not a good game day coach. Kirby Smart's eh, not a good X's and O's guy. He's not really all that much of a tactician. Hey, I listen to you guys. I'm not saying you can't theoretically be correct. Here's all I want to do. One day, if I ever have a net worth of seven or eight figures, I'm going to sacrifice a vast majority of my wealth in order to start a charity event. And here's how the event's going to work. I'm going to have two chairs on a stage and a giant screen, ability to dim the lights. It's going to be you in one chair. It's going to be Kirby in the other chair. It's going to be a chalk talk session just to cut up a film on the board, and it's going to be an audience out here. This is all going to charity, the Josh Foundation, namely. And you and him are just going to talk ball. And then when he twists you into an intellectual pretzel about 45 seconds into the event, then we're probably going to have a dunk tank off to the side so that I can make some of my money back. You would get talked into the ground with that man talking to you about football. So again, you could be right. I'm just saying... Your ability to sit at home and diagnose whether or whether or not some of these guys know football or whether they're good X's and O's guys. You, you see the tip of an iceberg. Underneath the iceberg is like a chunk of ice the size of the Chrysler building as it relates to what goes into one play call. The play call, you know, like, for instance, George is going to play Florida this year. And there's going to come a, a third and six situation midway through the third quarter. And you're sitting there asking yourself, oh, I wonder what play they're going to call. They're deciding it now. Dude, they're deciding that stuff right now. That's when you get outcoached. You don't get outcoached in a game. You get outcoached in May, in April, in spring. That I, One of my buddies from back home, Coach Chip, you need to check out his YouTube channel, by the way, said this the other day. I thought it was very apropos to the point I'm trying to make right now. He himself is a coach, been one for a long time, and said, uh, a lot of you out there love to talk about coaches being outcoached, and you think it happens in the heat of battle on game day. You may have this and that happen, but largely the haze in the barn before you ever get on the bus to go to the stadium, there are just certain situations you've already decided what you're going to call based on what personnel package is on the field, what formation, what's the situation, what's the down and distance, how much time I got on the clock, what quarter are we in? All that stuff's decided right now. They're having staff meetings and dedicating days and chunks of weeks to prepare for a team they're going to play five or six months from now, right now. That's where the out coaching happens. That's where the strategery happens. So all I ever do is laugh. You know, some of these folks talk about how coach is getting out coached. He's getting out coached. How in the world do you know? What, because he lost the game? Is, if it's that easy to figure out, then my mom home could do it. I don't think she's qualified to. I just don't think a lot of you are qualified to either. It's why you never hear me come on the air and say, Kirby Smart got out coached because even if he did, if we're being honest, I wouldn't know it and you wouldn't know it. Respectfully. Let's move on. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty ironic. Um, so just as I told you that a lot of us aren't equipped to judge a coach, it is time to seamlessly transition to tell you which head coaches have the most to prove in America this year. It is not hypocritical. I just want to tell you that. This is not hypocritical at all. There's a weird area in college football. Which head coaches have the most approved this year? There's this weird area that you get to sometimes in college football, and it's that area where a coach isn't on what you would call the hot seat, but yet also you're not satisfied as a fan base. Some of these coaches I'm about to talk about, they're in mm, that zone. Some of them are flat out in do or die mode, and some of them are in let's just get back to where we were mode. There's a wide variance. It's very much a case by case here. I never talk about hot seats. Very rarely do I talk about them because um, I don't like it, first off. But secondly, the reason I don't is because there's so much behind the scenes that impacts a coach's ability to do his job at the level you have set as an expectation. Some of them flat out aren't good enough. Some of them are handcuffed behind the scenes and you can't tell. But as much as we can tell, let's talk about this tonight. Ed Orgeron is the first one up. Ed Orgeron's got some stuff to prove this year. You couldn't write this. 
Because if I were to just blanketly tell you going into the 2019 season, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but a coach is going to win a national title and then have something to prove by 2021. You would have said, well, no, that's impossible. Give him at least two years after he wins a title. Well, sure enough, Orgeron won a title in 2019, and I think he's got a lot to prove. I think the fan base down there believes he's got a lot to prove this year. They were not prepared last year. But I want to finish that sentence. I think there are a lot of very highly thought of coaches out there that also wouldn't have been prepared given the unique set of circumstances that existed at LSU last year. Here's the problem. The problems were just as much internal as they were on the football field. Of course, you can't keep something internal. It bleeds onto the football field. That's where they've got to make up ground. Orgeron knows it. I heard him on radio the other day talking about helping freshmen move in. What do you think that stuff's about? That's about repairing his locker room. There was a lot of stuff down there. The closer you are to the program, the more you know what I'm talking about is valid. There's just some stuff about the fabric of the program that needs to be mended, okay? It's happened before. Hopefully it happens again for them, but they need a fast start. They go to UCLA. I don't care what the point spread is on the game. Football games are won on the field, not on a Vegas odds makers board. They got to win the game. They, I'm not, I guess I kind of am calling it must win. They can't go out to LA and lose week one against UCLA, point blank. Jim Harbaugh, second up here. Jim Harbaugh has got something to prove this year. I want you to look at your calendars, or I want you to pull them up in your head if you don't feel like pulling out a calendar. How long ago does it feel now that we were talking about this guy's contract? In reality, it was just December. January, February, March, that was five months ago. It feels like five years ago. Now, time has become somewhat of a, a weird thing given everything else going on in the world right now. But Jim Harbaugh, it's been kind of a quiet offseason up there, to be honest with you. He got his extension, but also a reduction in salary. And really, no one feels like they're any closer to knowing if they have the long-term answer here than they were before that contract got changed. J.J. McCarthy is the key. We can talk about Josh Gaddis at OC. We can talk about Harbaugh as the head coach. It's J.J. McCarthy. I mean, it's not rocket science out here. you got to get the right quarterback in. They think they did. I, uh, for the record, am in agreement with that. I think that's the best shot that they will have had. Problem is, he's a true freshman. So if we're talking about something to prove this year, he needs to have a great season as a true freshman. We don't even know that he's going to be the starter right now. So they've got to get things figured out because they also have big games early in the year. they got Washington coming in there in week two. Some of those game of the year numbers that were put out, Washington, two-and-a-half-point favorite in the big house, where the governor announced today they expect full capacity, so we will have that going for us up there. It isn't that they have not closed the gap on Ohio State. I know that's very popular to talk about, the gap. Have we closed the gap? It's not that. Certainly, there's a lot of unease about Michigan being a distant number two to Ohio State. That's the problem, though. What I just said is a lie. They're not number two in the Big Ten to Ohio State. They're not the second-best program up there right now. I'd easily take Wisconsin's program over Michigan right now. You could make an argument to take Iowa and Penn State over them. You, you could make those arguments. Indiana folks would fill my inbox right now and make a strong argument. They wouldn't play, trade places with Michigan if they could. I'm not going to go that far because of the result of one year. What I'm saying is it's not that they hadn't closed the gap on Ohio State. It's that it appears to Michigan fans that they've fallen further behind, and they may even be trying to – peer over the shoulders of other programs to even still see Ohio State. Yeah, that's a problem. What about Clay Helton as we go all the way out west now? Clay Helton at USC, this is when I, when I led the segment off and I talked about how you could find yourself in some unique positions in college football. Clay Helton, to me, is the strangest situation for a head coach that needs to prove something in all of college football. Let's just talk this through, you and I, and say this out loud together. The guy was in the Pac-12 championship game last year. The guy is going to enter the season consensus, top 15, top 20 caliber team. They're going to be expected to, according to odds, win the Pac-12 South. That's what they're going to be favored to do. And yet, if I were to take an approval rating of Southern Cal fans, and I were to just look at Trojan fans above or below 50%, Clay Helton's approval rating would be in the tank. It would be well below 50%. So how do you square that? Well, you square it by knowing what Southern Cal fans know. It's not good enough. A lot of that stuff's a mirage. A lot of being able to go 5-0 and and go to the Pac-12 championship game, it was more just a default of what else didn't exist. There were no other viable contenders. If you took this USC team, Trojan fans know this, it's why they've got an approval rating of the guy in the tank. And we took that USC team and we put them in the SEC West as is, 
it's a buzzsaw for them. I mean, it, it would be unequivocal. The answer of what needs to be happened there would be unequivocal, but it hasn't happened yet. That thing, uh, that hot seat talk that was really ramped up like two years ago and we thought there was going to be a move already made, well, it hasn't been made. And so every year when we talk about coaches that need to get something done and prove something, Clay Helton's always there. I will never forget one of my first orders of business when I got to 24-7 was hosting a National Signing Day show. I believe Wilt Fong was here, Barton was here at the time. That's general manager Barton Simmons now. And we were sitting there watching in disbelief that USC wasn't even going to finish in the top 50. Now, they rectified that last year, but for that to ever happen at any point, no matter the circumstances, at USC, not Cal Santa Barbara, USC, you can't have that. And so that's why a lot of them, they're looking around. They're kind of like we talked about the other day with Texas A&M fans once upon a time when Kevin Sumlin was there. They either wanted to win 10 or 11 games or wanted to win three or four and just leave no doubt what needed to happen. They don't want, USC fans do not want another eight-win season. That's not where they want to float. They want decisiveness one way or the other. How about James Franklin? Let's head to Happy Valley. Penn State, you already know my thoughts on this. I've shared them many times. All Penn State needs is to return to where they already were. See, this is a total different dynamic than what you're asking Jim Harbaugh to do at Michigan. You're asking him to do something he hasn't really done before. You're asking Clay Helton, in a lot of ways, to do something he hasn't done before. We're just asking James Franklin, get back where he was. Jesse's showing you right now, if you're watching on YouTube, what they had done prior to last year. 11 wins in 2016, 11 wins in 2017, uh, nine wins in 2018, back to 11 wins in 2019, and then it falls off the cliff. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, this is a very good graphical representation of what an exception to the rule looks like. Which of those years stands out? I would argue it's not the 11 win season because he's got three of them. I would argue that four and what is it, four and five season last year, that's the one that sticks out. Okay, so like I said, all James Franklin needs to do this year is get things back to where they were. They were floating around a double-digit win per year program already. Just get it back to where it is. That's the edge he has, he being James Franklin, over a guy like Harbaugh. There is one edge that Harbaugh has over, over Penn State and James Franklin, and that is it looks like they have their answer to quarterback at Michigan. J.J. McCarthy's about as close to an answer as they're going to get up there. I don't know that we have that yet at Penn State. Fingers crossed that things work out with Mr. Yursich this year, and all of a sudden guys do want to flock to Happy Valley to play. And last uh, but not least, Justin Fuente. What do you think about a record of 38-26? and 26? That's what he's been there as head coach. I thought he was done last year. I'm very surprised he's still the head coach at Virginia Tech. I really think that that beating of Virginia in the last regular season, a regular game of the season, um, I think that probably went a long way in him maintaining that job. But again, even as I talk about Justin Fuente, probably if you're going to do a hot seat comparison here, him being on the hottest of seats, even as we talk like that, I really think that behind the scenes, there is a picture that needs to be painted to be fair here. And that is Virginia Tech. They have been behind the eight ball for a while in terms of resources and keeping up with the proverbial Joneses, you know, in the conference. I know they've taken steps recently. And so let's acknowledge that. But, I mean, they're trying to take steps to just stay in the upper half of the ACC, not the SEC. Stay in the upper half of the ACC. And if you just know the history of college football but you don't know the particulars and the inner workings, you just assume Virginia Tech, well, that's one of the most serious football schools in the ACC. It's one of the most serious traditions. You just can't assume this stuff works on autopilot. you got to have the right people at the wheel. So I'm saying that to say... You look at Justin Fuente in 38-26, and, uh, and 26 and you say that's not good enough. What if the resources he's been working with haven't been good enough? I'm putting it out there rhetorically. It's not my personal argument. I'm saying it could be a valid argument. So those are the coaches that I look at right now with probably the most to prove this year, Orgeron, Harbaugh, Helton, Franklin, and Fuente. Good show tonight. I want to remind you again, be following those social channels. Got some stuff coming this week, actually, at Late Kick Josh. I promised we wouldn't go an hour tonight, and we didn't. So it's a good way to wrap up the week. Thank you so much for watching the show. Remember, liking the videos is what we love. Subscribe to the channel. About to top 50,000 on YouTube, and we've been doing this about a year, Colin, I would say. Yeah, cranked this thing up about a year ago. So we've had a lot of fun here. Pales in comparison to what we have coming in the future, though. So in the meantime... 
about to go get an early start on the weekend. For Director Emeritus Colin, Jesse, and crew in Connecticut, I'm Josh Pate. Have a great start to your weekend, and God bless.